dominate the world. With World Construction Set version 2, for accurate photorealistic terrain rendering and animation, nothing else compares. Render great looking close-ups or entire planets. Explore the terrain of real places using actual latitude and longitude coordinates. Or create strange alien places no one has ever seen. You can animate over 100 parameters for motion, complex ecosystems, 3D evolving clouds, reflecting water with waves, breakers and beaches, and comprehensive color parameters, all animatable with professional quality spline-based keyframe animation. The interactive visual interface makes it fast. Wizards and automated science-based features make it easy. Yet extensive control is there for power users. You want more? World Construction Set now has direct support for Lightwave 3D and 3D Studio. Imagine what you'll do with this kind of world-dominating power. WCS version 2 is now available on multiple platforms. If you want the best in terrain rendering and animation, contact Questar Productions today. Jamie Kurtz, and I wrote the manual for World Construction Set. In this tutorial, we will be looking at one way to combine World Construction Set with Lightweight. It's my hope that the techniques you learn here will inspire further exploration of both programs. Both programs are very powerful and very deep. We will be covering five steps. Creating World Construction Set project, creating a camera path in World Construction Set, rendering in World Construction Set, exporting to Lightwave, and adding a Lightwave object. The Amiga and Windows versions of WCS are very similar. You will be seeing the Amiga version in this tutorial. Normally I run it on an 1120 by 832 resolution screen, but to make it easier for you to see what I'm doing, I'm running it on a video resolution screen at roughly 640 by 480. When you start World Construction Set, you'll see the Module Control Panel. From here, you can access all of WCS's features. The first thing we want to do is create a new project. So go to the Project menu and select the New command. This opens the New Project window. From here, we can create a new project from scratch or clone an existing project. In the interest of time, what we'll do is clone an existing project. So click on the File Requester button on the right edge of the Clone Project field and that opens a file requester and again similar functionality in Windows uh, even though things may look a little different there okay in the file requester it immediately goes to your WCS projects drawer and it shows us the projects that ship with World Construction Set including uh, Canyon Sunset which is the one that we're going to clone so select Canyon Sunset and say okay alright now all you have to do is tell it what the new project is going to be called and again you can use the file requester button and tell it what the name of the drawer should be so I'm going to call this one light speed okay our new project is light speed we are cloning Canyon Sunset and I will say save now what happens is it will choose the parameter file that the project we are cloning was using so we say okay to that and it goes ahead and it creates a, a parameter file, a project file, and a database file. And the status log comes up and tells us what just happened. The status log in World Construction Set is always there to tell you what's going on. So you can leave it open as you work if you wish. And just to keep things clean, I will close it for now. All right, so now we're back at the module control panel, and I will open the parameter module you do that by clicking on the parameter module button and uh, we're going to change a few things about this uh, cloned project uh, if you remember or if you've looked at what that project actually produces it's a very nice uh, sunset and then a moonrise over some water in uh, a canyon lands kind of environment and w we're going to do a canyon fly through and we don't want to have 
the uh, changes in colors and the motion of the sun and the moon that you see in that animation. So we're going to change those things. So the first thing we'll do is we'll open up the color editor. And the color editor lets you change and animate all the color parameters. And there are a whole lot of color parameters to choose from. Any parameter that has keyframes that's being animated is shown in white. Other parameters that just have set numbers that hold throughout the animation are sh shown in black. So what we want to do is change the ones that are shown in white and get rid of the keyframes. So I'll show you how to do that with the first one, and you can go through and remove them for the rest. Select sunlight by clicking it, and then all you have to do is go down and click the delete all button to get rid of all keyframes for sunlight. Light. It will ask you if you're sure it will say, delete all sunlight keyframes, and you say OK. And now you see sunlight has turned black to indicate that it has no keyframes. So its first setting will hold for the entire animation. So go ahead and continue on and delete the rest of the keyframes. And we will have a nice, solid, steady color setting for our animation. Once you're done, close the color editor window using the keep button in the lower left corner. Uh, if you would have closed it with the cancel button, that would have undone all the changes you just did. So it's like a uh, global undo just for that window to hit cancel. But we want to keep your changes, so hit keep and the window will close. All right, the next window we want to open is the ecosystem window. And uh, again, in the parameter module, just click the ecosystem button. The windows in World Construction Set are not generally modal. So I'm telling you to close these windows as we go, just keep things less cluttered for the tutorial. But you can actually leave them open and uh, jump from window to window as you wish. Again, in the Ecosystem Editor, we see a list of parameters on the left. And the one we're interested in is at the top of the list called Water. You might have noticed in the Canyon Sunset project the gorgeous reflective water. We're going to get rid of that for this project. It's actually, the terrain is actually the Grand Canyon, and we want to see a little deeper down into the canyon and fly through it. So select water at the top of the list, and then go over and change sea level to zero. Use the keep button to close the window and keep that change. Okay, we're done uh, with our getting our project ready to go, and our next step will be to create a camera path in World Construction Set. Click the Map View button in the Module Control Panel. With the Map View window open and its associated Map View Control window, make sure you zoom in to the 2 DEM files so you can see them easily. And make sure Topo is selected and you're using the single drawing style. And if you have to change all that to get what you see here, make sure you click the Draw button again, and it will redraw the screen and or the uh, contents of the Map View window to show you what you see here. Using the single gradient view, which uses black for the lower areas and, and lighter colors for the higher areas, it's easier to see the uh, canyon path here. This is the Grand Canyon. And it's also easy to see our interactive elements on top, the camera here and the focus point, and the haze ring, uh, some of the elements that we can just move around, uh, as you see. I could move them here and just create keyframes, much like in Lightwave. I can also move them in a camera view, where I see what the camera sees, and again, uh, create keyframes there. But what we want to do now is make a path down the canyon. And it's really the easiest way to do that is to uh, create a new object and have the uh, camera follow that path. So basically we'll be drawing in our path by placing points along here. So what we need to do is go up to the menu and we will select the from the object menu select the add points command and it pops up a sub menu and select new in that sub menu. Okay and it's asking us digitize new points for the active vector object or create a new object. We want to create a new object. So now it asks us to enter an, a name for that object. And let's call it cam path. OK, now in the map view control window, it's telling us what it expects next. Uh, WCS wants us to set a label point, And that's just a throwaway point that 
the program will eventually use for labeling when you're uh, digitizing objects for maps, things like that. In this case, keep your eye on this space at the bottom of the map view control window as we work, and it will keep asking you for the next point in turn and tell you what commands can end your uh, point entry procedure. So we're up here in the map view window, and I'm just going to start dropping some points. I left click, and that was our label point. That's the throwaway point. Now we start the real path. So I'll start it in the same place. Add another point, another point. And you can add as many points as you like and just describe a little path down the canyon, however you want that path to be. When you're all done, uh, it's asking us to hit return to interpolate, C to close, or Q to quit. And what I want to do is hit Q, that quits, and then I say it asks uh, if I want to accept that to hit return or escape to cancel. So escape gets, gets you out of it if you don't want to create this motion path. We do want to create the motion path, so I will hit the return key. And there it is. And it uh, pops up a requester and says conform vector to terrain, and we'll say yes. And that causes the motion path to follow the up and down uh, changes in the terrain immediately below it. Okay, now we need to go back up to the menu, select the motion menu, the path command, and that opens a submenu, and you select the vector to camera uh, command from that menu. And it's going to tell us that current keyframes exist. Proceeding will delete current keyframes, current values. Those are the keyframes from that other project that we cloned, so we don't care about that. Those were motion keyframes. We didn't delete any of those. By saying proceed here, that will delete those and replace them with our new camera path, which is exactly what we want to do. So I click proceed, and then it asks me for the frame interval for each vector segment. Now, this is you can put in whatever you want. Obviously, more frames will mean a slower speed, less frames will mean a faster speed, and the more frames you have, the longer it will take to render, and the longer it will last. So make whatever uh, judgment you want here. I'm going to say uh, three seconds between each 90 frames. Now it asks if we want to use elevation data, and we will say yes. Okay, the, this question is, uh, modify altitudes with current flattening, datum, and vertical exaggeration? And again, the answer is yes. Okay, now we have our camera path created. So let's uh, go ahead and close the map view window. And we will open up the motion window from the parameter module. The motion editor, uh, like the other parameter editors we looked at, color and ecosystem, shows the parameters on the left in a scrollable list. Uh, you click the parameter you're interested in, and you can see the values for it on the right. And the keyframe controls are on the lower right. Again, white uh, parameters have keyframes, and black ones aren't being animated. OK, we're going to, from the motion editor window, open up the timelines window by clicking the timelines button. And we see the timeline. It's a motion graph. This should look familiar to LightWave animators. You can see a variety of parameters graphed. And what we're looking at now is camera altitude. And the camera altitude is shown in red, and it's graphed against the height of the terrain uh, along the camera path that we just created. And what we're going to, uh, what I'd like you to notice here is that the uh, camera is getting right down on the terrain, and in uh, some cases, the terrain is higher than the camera, where uh, the terrain changed between those points that we put down. So what we want to do is we want to bring the camera up a little bit, and let me show you a trick for that. On the motion editor window, click the scale button to open the scale keys window. The scale keys window lets you change groups of keyframes together, and what we're going to do is say for all frames, Shift the values, and we're just going to add one to those values. Now watch the graph. When I say operate, click the operate button at the bottom, then those paths go right up above the landscape. So 
That's a quick way to move the entire camera path up. You can also grab any of these keyframe points and just drag them in the motion graph. But if you want to do a bunch of them together, the scale key uh, window is a very good tool to have. All right, so after you've done that on yours, go ahead and keep the scale keys window changes, keep the motion timeline change, and we're back to the motion editor. And uh, all that's left to do is to set look ahead, bank turns, and velocity distributions. If you look at the top of the motion editor, you'll see some options buttons. What these do is they open up another window called the Render Settings Editor. These are settings that you don't animate that you set before you render. And the look ahead, uh, bank turns, and velocity distribution are found there. So you could open that from the module control panel, but a quick way at the top of all of the uh, parameter editor windows is to click on one of the options buttons and go directly to the page in the Render Settings Editor that you need. In this case, we want the Paths page, so I'll just click that button and up pops the Render Settings Editor on the Motion Paths and Vectors page. Here we have our Look Ahead turns, our Bank turns, and Velocity Distribution. Turn Look Ahead on, and I'm going to give mine a 10-frame Look Ahead. Uh, you can experiment with different values. Uh, larger values will give you smoother looking motion. What this does is points the camera ahead along your motion path and in this case I'm pointing it 10 frames ahead. I'm going to turn bank turns on. That will give the camera a bit of a bank as it rounds turns. A little bit goes a long way here. I'm going to leave that set at 1. Uh, you can also just use manual keyframes to set banking. If you're doing uh, difficult motion paths, sometimes it works better manually. And I'll turn velocity distribution on and that will keep my speed the same over our entire motion path. So now it doesn't matter where I drop those points on the map view, my uh, velocity of the camera will be consistent all the way through. And on top of that, it enables ease in and ease out. So if you want to have it slowly gain speed and then slowly come to a stop at the end, you can uh, use these fields. I'm going to leave those uh, off for now. This would be a good time to save your project. So you can go to the project menu, use the save command, and save everything. Congratulations, you have created a Canyon fly-through scene. Our next step is to render it. So we're on the rending, render settings editor already in the motion paths and vectors page. Flip up to, uh, let me go to the top here, render and size page. You can see there's a, a few different groups of things that you can change before you render. The render and size, you want to set up the width and height of your output image. If you're using a toaster flyer, uh, 752 by 480 is what you would set here with an aspect ratio of 1.2. If you are using a perception or a par or a broadcaster elite, use 720 by 480. Then you can set up the start and end frames the number of steps that you want to render, and the total number of frames. And if you change any of those, everything will change. Then select RGB rendering on, and screen rendering on or off, depending on if you want to see it on the screen, giving you a preview as you render. With it on, it's a slightly longer rendering time, but it might be nice to see. So that's up to you. And you can choose to have field rendering or no field rendering. And if you have field rendering on, you can choose the field dominance. Okay, now let's jump to the image save page and choose your save path. It defaults to the WCS frames drawer. You can use the file requester button to assign that to any drawer you want. The default name is Lightspeed, the name of our project. That's fine with me, so we'll leave that. Now go to the fractals page and set your fractal depth. I'm going to set mine at 4. I'm going to use fractal displacement rendering, a new rendering technique in WCS version 2 that gives you very detailed landscapes. And I'm going to use fractal depth maps, and I strongly suggest you do too. With fractal depth maps, uh, WCS goes through and looks through the entire camera path, and it notices which polygons are close to the camera, which are further away. It gives the close-up ones more detail, less to the ones further away, saving a lot of rendering time and yet giving you very good quality. Before you can use this, you have to create fractal maps. So click the Create Fractal Maps button once you've set up your fractal depth, and enter the maximum pixel size, I will suggest that you use two, 
and enter the first frame to scan, and that'll be the first frame in your animation. Give it the last frame to scan, that'll be the last frame in your anim animation, and then tell it to go. Now, it's going to take a while when you do this, but it saves you so much rendering time down the road, it's, it's well worth doing. Finally, let's go to the miscellaneous page and turn off a few things we're not using. We're not using waves. We don't need reflections, sun and moon. Turn all those things off. 3D clouds, that's up to you. If you turn it off, it saves memory and time. If you turn it on, it looks great. So uh, that's your call. And then uh, jump to the uh, processing page. And let's turn blur on with a blur factor of 1. And let's use Z-buffered blur with a max blur offset also of 1. And what that'll do is it will blur the edges of the mountains against the sky a little bit, or the cliffs. And um, it's a, sort of a, a way to anti-alias those edges with the sky. All right, with everything set, you can click the Render button at the bottom of the Render Settings Editor window to start it rendering. It will create the frames on your hard drive. And uh, before you do that, if you want to do a preview render from the uh, camera view window, uh, you can do that, and that's what this would look like. This is what it looks like fully rendered, a uh, canyon fly-through that I did earlier. Okay, we're done with the rendering. Let's export to LightWave. Back at the Module Control Panel, open the Data Ops module and select the Export LightWave command. That opens the LightWave export window where you've got your choice of uh, exporting the scene uh, and the DEMs or just the motion. What we want to do is export the scene file. Uh, we don't need the DEMs if you're doing, uh, if you're animating around a fixed object like a house or something, you might want them in LightWave for reference. But for this, we're just flying over the canyon, and so all we need is the scene file. Click ro Rotate to Horizontal. That makes it easier to work with things in LightWave. That flips the part of the Earth you're working on to the top of the world so that it's uh, generally flat in LightWave. Remember, LightWave uses XYZ space, and World Construction Set uses uh, latitude, longitude, and altitude around a spherical surface, which is, uh, you know, the Earth is not flat. And uh, World Construction Set knows that. Okay, click the Export button, and it will ask you where you want to save your scene. And uh, you might put that in your Scenes drawer, and save the scene. And then it wants to know where to look for the LightWave DEMs if you're going to use them. And it doesn't matter here since we're not. But uh, you might also try and experiment uh, using the Scene and DEM export. Uh, option because it's kind of fun to see those DEMs in LightWave, although you wouldn't want to render them from LightWave. LightWave doesn't have the ability to uh, do all the texturing and trees. Uh, we really don't have time to get into trees, but World Construction Set uh, has some amazing capability with uh, tree, 3D shaded tree images, and you can make your own. Um, okay, so that uh, has saved the scene file, and what it does is it actually saves a camera motion path with a keyframe for every frame, and it has to do this because of the translation between the two types of spaces in the two programs. All right, now we're done with World Construction Set for the moment, and now let's go to LightWave. In LightWave, I've loaded the scene file, and I've actually already added an object here. The scene file, when you save it from World Construction Set, includes the first and last frame numbers and frame step, the camera motion path, camera zoom factor or envelope, the uh, paths and names of DEMs uh, if you save them, and the position of the DEM objects if you save them as objects, the sun as a point light, a, uh, the sunlight color and level, the ambient light color and level, fog and haze distance settings or envelopes, field rendering settings, path and base name of the WCS animation, and you see that here in the background, that animation uh, I rendered earlier automatically loaded as a background in LightWave. So it's a very uh, comprehensive scene saving in World Construction Set, and it makes it a lot easier once you get into LightWave. All the objects, including the camera and the light representing the sun, are parented to a null object, and that null object is at the center of the Earth, and if you rotate that object, everything else rotates. So when we selected the Rotate to Horizontal button in World Construction Set, it saved the scene out with that null object rotated 
so that our scene here is at the top of the world, so to speak, the, uh, right along the y-axis in light wave space. All right, go ahead and load the 747 object, which is in the aviation directory. It, uh, it's one of the objects that came with LightWave. Then select the camera to edit and open the motion graph. What we want to do now is take this uh, camera path and save it, and then load that into the motion graph for the 747. Okay, so now your camera and your 747 have the same motion path. The next thing you want to do is, for the 747, uh, parent that to the WCS null object. Once you've done that, now the camera and the motion path are synchronized together. And the next thing you want to do is offset the motion path. Uh, let's try 10 frames. Okay, a couple ways you could do that. You could either delete the first 10 frames in the motion path for the object, or in the motion path for the camera, you could move it over 10 frames like I've done here using the shift key uh, button and just typing in uh, 10 where it says shift frames by. Uh, either way, uh, the, can the airplane will then be out right in front of the camera and the camera will be following it all the way through uh, 10 frames later. So you get a kind of a nice look, a nice chase look. Now there is a problem and uh, I hate to even bring it up, but there seems to be a slight rounding error in LightWave. This has been reported, and hopefully by the time you do this, the problem won't exist anymore. But in this version of the uh, Amiga LightWave, there's a slight rounding error, and you'll see it in the animation. It looks like the plane is undergoing a little bit of turbulence as it flies through the canyon. On the uh, uh, Alpha uh, version, uh, Beta version of the Alpha, uh, the rounding error was much more severe. Uh, but again, hopefully that will be fixed by the time you try this uh, exercise. If not, uh, until they fix it, some workarounds include uh, move the uh, motion path of the object farther apart from the camera and then make the object bigger to make it look like it's still the same distance away. Or you might try deleting some of the keyframes uh, just picking a few and deleting some of the others, then the motion paths, uh, uh, do that for the airplane, then the motion paths won't be uh, as exact. Uh, but then again, that might look more natural too. A rail chase plane may not track uh, the airplane that you're following uh, as exactly as uh, this example animation shows. So those are some workarounds to play with. Hopefully you won't need them, uh, but you could try some of those techniques, uh, or at least the latter technique. Anyway, just to see what you come up with. Okay, so now we have our camera chasing our object. And the final step before we render is to make that object look like it fits in with the landscape a little better. And to do that, we're going to open up the surfaces window in LightWave. And uh, let me suggest a couple of things. Do a slight reflection of the background images, which is the landscape, in the belly of the aircraft. So choose the uh, main fuselage, and I've set the reflectivity to 20%, and I'm reflecting the light speed sequence. And I've set my diffusion level back to 80%, so try that. And then I've also loaded the fractal reflections uh, image that comes with LightWave, and I've put that into the uh, wing box and lift devices surfaces, and I'm, I'm doing a 10% reflectivity of that, but I've dro dropped the diffuse level to 50%. So that's something else you might try. And here's uh, showing some of the difference between the way that I've changed the airplane to look and the way that the uh, uh, default settings look. And one more thing that I did that you can also see is I added another light. I put it at the center of the Earth, so I just... Uh, parented it to the uh, WCS null object, and uh, set it at, uh, let's see, set it at 35% intensity, set the light cover color to uh, a kind of an orangish glow coming up from the landscape to simulate the sun reflecting off the landscape and lighting the bottom of the plane a little bit. So I used uh, red 255, green 182, and blue 125. 
you can try that. And uh, again, the overall point is you just want to make your object look like it belongs in the landscape. This can go a long way towards making the effect believable. Don't forget to set the proper image size and aspect ratio. When you've got all that set up, you're finally ready to render, and here's what it looks like. This is just one example of what you can do with World Construction Set and Lightwave, two very powerful tools. We created a project, created a camera path, rendered in WCS, exported to Lightwave, and added a Lightwave object. That's all we have time for for this tutorial. Thanks for watching, enjoy your explorations, and render on. web in an attempt to better serve our customers the lightspeed website is now online with easy access to lots of cool stuff the lightspeed website is open to anyone who has access to the world wide web but use the netscape navigator web browser software for best results lightspeed viewers may download archives of the lightspeed companion disc for free by entering the following password. Find out about and order other Lightspeed products while online. Fill out the online viewer response form and let us know what you think of each issue of Lightspeed. Join the Lightspeed mailing list to find out about new and exciting products from the makers of Lightspeed. Find links to other excellent sites on the World Wide Web. All of this and more can be found on the Lightspeed website. I'm Dave Warner, and right now I want to take a few minutes to tell you about the newest version of IMPACT made by Dynamic Realities. IMPACT is a physics simulation program that runs separately from LightWave, but the scene files that it creates can only be used from within LightWave. Now in the very first issue of Lightspeed, Robert Cohen did a review on IMPACT, but at the time the only available version was a beta 0.92. Since then, a number of things have been improved and fixed. In the final 1.0 version, its shipping is much improved. So let's take a look at it right now. Impact's interface has changed very little from previous versions. 
This is what the Amiga version's default screen settings look like, but since it uses the very flexible Magic User Interface, I've reconfigured it to be a little easier on the eyes. The Windows NT version of Impact simply uses the screen colors set in the Windows NT control panel. As I go into detail about the new features found in Impact 1.0, I'll also walk through the steps normally involved in putting together an Impact simulation. The first step is to create a scene in Lightwave and import it into Impact. This is done from the project menu. After the scene has finished loading, I go to the materials menu and set up the different material names I'll need for the different objects in my simulation. Each of these materials can have different density, elasticity, and roughness settings, all of which can have their values enveloped over time. Next, I go to the Objects menu and choose the object that I want to modify. I set its material name, whether the object will follow keyframed or kinematic movements, whether collision detection should be applied, and if so, which kind of collision detection should be used. Here are some examples of the different collision detection types. This animation uses sphere and box-shaped collision detection. These are the fastest collision detection types in impact and should be used whenever possible to speed up simulation time. This animation uses spear and arbitrary shape collision detection. Arbitrary shape collision detection will take much longer to simulate, but if I only have one arbitrary shape object in the simulation, impact will still run the simulation very quickly. Previous versions of impact only featured the spear and box shape collision detection types but arbitrary shape collision detection is now fully supported in the final release. This animation uses spear, box, and arbitrary shape collision detection. Simulations that have multiple objects using arbitrary shape collision detection can take a long time to simulate, so this type of collision detection should be used sparingly. Once I've finished setting things up in the objects menu, I then go to the engines menu and select which engines I want active in the simulation and which objects will be affected by those engines. Impact's engines are certainly the most powerful part of this entire software package. They can be used in conjunction with each other to create some very impressive effects. The different engine types are force field, this engine will attract or repel kinematic objects to or away from the object that has the force field engine applied to it. This engine is particularly good for creating explosions, as you can see here. Gravity. This engine is exactly what you might expect. It gives objects weight based upon their size and the mass settings that are specified in the materials menu. The default setting is for normal earth gravity but it's very easy to simulate a much stronger or weaker force of gravity and envelope it over time. Law of Gravity This engine will affect an object's ability to attract other objects based upon their mass and distance from each other. This is a rarely used engine and will usually not have any noticeable effects unless you're crashing planets into each other. Springy Thingy this engine will make objects act like there are strings attached to each object's center of gravity. It offers full control over how strong the spring force is, the rest length of each spring, and the most recent version of Impact has a dampening force to prevent springs from bouncing wildly out of control. Thruster. This engine will apply a force to an object and push it in one direction based upon how strong the force is. This is useful for creating realistic rocket launches, although it can be tricky to get the exact results you want, as you can see from this animation. Torque Motor This engine applies a clockwise rotation to an object. If you specify a constant value for the amount of torque this engine generates, it will make the object continually accelerate, and in the case of this rolling wheel, the object will eventually spin wildly out of control. Viscous drag is the final engine, and it has an effect similar to pouring glue on an object's surface. In this animation, a viscous drag engine has been applied to the objects at the end of the ramp, and when the rolling ball reaches this spot, it slows down and stops. Once all of the engines have been added, I go back to the project menu and set how long I want the simulation to run. I then save the project and run the simulation. 
When the simulation is complete, I would normally export a LightWave scene and render it out. But instead, I'll open up a preview window, position it anywhere on the screen I want it to be, and select what type of view I want in the window. There is a full array of object manipulation tools to move, rotate, and resize things, but you cannot create keyframes from within the impact. All motion paths and envelopes must be created within LightWave itself. Any number of preview windows can be opened at any time. I usually open one immediately after loading a project or importing a scene so that I can watch the progress of a simulation. I'll open one now and then generate a wireframe preview of the simulation that I just ran. This is done from the preview menu by selecting which view I want to make a wireframe preview for and then clicking on playback simulation. I can then easily play back the wireframe preview once it is finished generating. This feature was not implemented in previous versions of Impact, but it works quite nicely now. I can open as many preview windows as I want. I can even alter the appearance of preview windows by selecting the View Prefs menu. Other important new features that have been added to the final version of Impact include the Become Kinematic at Contact function allows a keyframed object to become kinematic when another object collides with it. It is also now possible to make an object become kinematic at a specific point in time. The Algorithms menu is one of the most important and useful new features in Impact. It allows me to select a group of objects and change different variables with just a few button clicks. I can apply random, exponential, or trig values to these objects with a lot of control over the end results. An example of the usefulness of the algorithms menu would be this brick wall. It would have taken a fair amount of time to position all of these brick objects and create the wall in LightWave, but just by applying exponential values to the X and Y position variables, I was able to position 100 brick objects in just a minute or two. The Become Kinematic Time variable is particularly useful because it allows you to select a large group of objects and make them all kinematic randomly or at specific times. The Record Every Frame function allows me to set a much higher frames per second sampling rate and still output a light wave scene that would play back correctly when rendered. Setting a higher frames per second sampling rate will help eliminate one of Impact's weaknesses which is difficulty handling simultaneous collision detections. This animation shows what happens when impact has to deal with a large number of simultaneous collisions. The brick wall has 100 brick objects in it, and as they pile up on top of each other, impact has trouble detecting all of the simultaneous collisions that are occurring. If I had increased the frames per second sampling rate on this simulation, it's likely that the bricks would not fall through each other or the ground. The Control Press pull-down menu also offers a number of options to improve Impact's performance when running a simulation. Some of these options improve Impact's ability to handle simultaneous object collisions, while others speed up the time it takes for Impact to run a simulation. In addition to all the new features, a number of bugs have been eliminated, but the final release of Impact is not without its faults. The documentation comes mostly in the form of an interactive text file that will give you all of the information that you need to get Impact up and running, but it could really use some detailed explanations of how certain things work, and some tutorials would be extremely helpful. Impact's user interface lacks many of LightWave's basic animation features, like an envelope editor and support for bones, displacement mapping, or inverse kinematics. Impact would benefit greatly if it were ported to a LightWave plugin format and just made use of these features as they're already built into LightWave. The good people at Dynamic Realities are well aware of these limitations and are working hard to improve upon Impact. In fact, by the time you watch this review, a new and significantly improved manual should be shipping with the latest version. Overall, Impact is a very powerful and very useful piece of software but it must be used appropriately. It is not a replacement for good animation skills, so you should not expect Impact to do all of the work for you. Something like this Domino Theory animation ran fine as an Impact simulation, but in all honesty, I probably could have created this animation in less time without the use of Impact, although it may not have looked quite as realistic. 
The thing that I like most about Impact is the company that makes it. Dynamic Realities is very committed to the support and development of this program. I've been beta testing it since December of 1994, and in that time I've received more than a dozen new upgrades. As they continue to develop new versions of Impact, it promises to become an even more powerful program than it already is. I definitely recommend it. That's all the time I have for this review, so until the next issue of Lightspeed, I'm Dave Warner, and I'll see you then. Replica, Replica Technology is pleased, pleased to, bring to bring you three CD-ROM CD collections of professional 3D, 3D objects. objects. The Camelot, Camelot collection contains more than 300 objects from medieval, medieval times. times. It features a complete 12th century European castle with furnishing, weapons, and other structures. The interior design collection contains more than 500 pieces of furniture, furnishings, and construction objects. It features four complete homes. The Wright collection contains more than 100 different furnishings and pieces styled after the designs of Frank Lloyd Wright. Each CD-ROM collection comes complete with scenes, browser images, and many preview animations. They can be used with LightWave 3D as well as many other 3D animation programs. For more information, call Replica Technology. Bob Cohen, and we're going to take a look at Light ROM 3 by Graphic Detail. Let's get to it. The availability of LightWave objects, textures, surfaces, and other related files on the internet is becoming staggering. Light ROM 3, published by Graphic Detail, is a three CD-ROM collection of all sorts of LightWave-oriented files, including objects, textures, surfaces, toaster wipes, fonts for LightWave and toaster paint, programs and demos for both the Amiga and the PC platform, and DEMs, Digital Elevation Maps. Did I mention DEMs? There is one ROM chock full of about a thousand of them for use with VistaPro, World Construction Set, and most other programs that can read the file format. Light ROM 3 also contains some text files and electronic magazines. Objects come in Lightwave, 3D Studio, Imagine, Real 3D, and Sculpt file format. However, not all objects are offered in all file formats. Also contained in this collection is a series of altitude maps, which can be used instead of DDM data, along with LightWave's displacement function. There are thumbnail renderings of most objects, and the image and texture maps contained, which makes finding the right file almost too easy. Let's browse the thumbnails now to see just how vast this collection is.
for about $50, LightROM 3 is a must-have for your CD-ROM collection. Even if you do have access to the internet, this product will save you hours of download time, as well as many precious megabytes of hard drive space. Graphic Detail Incorporated can be reached at 4556 South 3rd Street, Louisville, Kentucky, 40214, or by email at the following address. I'm Bob Cohen, until next time. Motion Clips. Moving clip art for desktop video, 3D artists, and non-linear editors. 8,000 JPEG frames, all on one CD-ROM. Awesome! Reports Video Toaster User Magazine. This CD is a must-have for computer artists and animators. 20 scenes at 30 frames a second, all with a screen size of 752 by 480. Just perfect for the video flyer, lightweight, Hollywood effects, and alpha paint. To order, call 716-881-5215. Not very long ago, in animation studios all around the world, Lightwave 3D animators had the ability to create their own plugins with a scripting language known as AREX. But this language only worked on the Amiga computer. So when Lightwave 3D became available on other computer platforms, animators no longer had a scripting language to work with. Until, Until now. now. Virtual Visions Incorporated is proud to announce the next generation of Lightwave 3D Modeler Scripting. BML for Modeler is a complete plug-in development system for Lightwave 3D Modeler. Offering components for both source and runtime use of scripts, the BML for Modeler system consists of an interpreter plug-in and a script compiler, each sold separately. Call Virtual Visions and order your copy today. Justin Barrett, and in this issue of Lightspeed, I'm going to show you how to make sloshing liquids using a technique that I like to call an oscillating morph. You saw another example of the oscillating morph a few issues back when Dean Scott showed you how to make bouncing logos. This time I'm going to use a similar technique to make some wine sloshing around inside a wine glass. And since we are basing this tutorial on something that's in reality, let's take a little bit of a look um, at some, a real liquid object and see how it moves and that will give us uh, a reference to go by as we're creating our objects. Now you'll notice that while the glass is sitting here still and, and untouched, the top surface of the liquid is again just motionless, but when we start to move the object and kind of slosh it around a bit, the liquid just kind of, the top surface just kind of rocks back and forth around a certain uh, central axis or a point on one, on one particular side of it. And also depending on on how it sloshed, it can kind of rotate as it sloshes around. So we'll primarily focus on the rocking motion of the top surface of this liquid here. 
um, as we're creating our objects. And then when we go into layout, we can simply rotate that object as we're morphing it back and forth, and that will create the rotation uh, that's sometimes seen when a liquid is bumped and sloshed around. Okay, now we're going to go into Lightwave Modeler and start building our objects. And before we begin, I want to let you know that I'm running Lightwave 4.0 on a 100 megahertz 486 with 40 megabytes of RAM. First thing we're going to do is to model the first, the primary wine object that we have that has the level top surface. And to start this off, we are going to make a ball, uh, select the ball and hit numeric. We're going to create a tessellated ball. Go ahead and leave it at level 2 for now. Um, with uh, x at 0, and y and 0, and z at 0 for the center. For the radius, we need x at 35 millimeters, y at 70 millimeters, and z at 35 millimeters. Um, and we'll kind of zoom in on this a little bit here, and go ahead and hit enter to create that. Spacebar gets rid of the little bounding box there. And now that we've got this, we're just going to be using the bottom half so use the right mouse button to draw a lasso around the top half of the object. Actually, no, we need to have this on polygon. Select those top polygons. Hit Z to just go ahead and plain old delete those. Oops, I hit Z twice. There we are. Okay, hit A. There we go. That sizes it up in the windows. And now we're going to be putting a copy of this. Hit C to make a copy. Go to, let's say, lay, uh, layer 5, hit V to paste it in, and then one, go back to layer 1. We're going to be using that a little bit later on to create the wine glass, so we have the same base object to, cre to create both objects that we're going to be using. Now for the wine, since we are going to be rotating it once we get it into layout, um, I'm going to want to take and make this bottom mesh of polygons here a bit more finely detailed. So I'm going to go into polygon, the polygon menu, and lasso around that whole bottom mess of polygons there and then subdivide smooth go ahead and leave everything else as it is hit OK and it'll break that down into a, a very much more smooth mesh of polygons and that way when it's rotated um, the facets that make up the edge of the polygons won't noticeably go by when you see the edge of the object the next thing we need to do is to make a top surface for this wine object and we'll do that by first deselecting all these points and or polygons rather then we'll grab the point control and we're going to select all these points up here and copy them go to layer two hit paste and we're going to use those and just kind of trace around them in order clockwise the reason we copied them over here is because there's such a fine mesh of points with the main wine object that uh, it's easy to grab other points that you don't need and it th throws off the point order once you have all those points selected in the polygon menu, um, select Make, and then go down to Polygon, and you can make sure, okay, the normal is pointing in the proper direction. So copy that polygon. Actually, you can X cut to cut it out. Go back to layer one, and hit V to paste it in. And now we should have, okay, there's our wine top right there. We're not going to merge points because later on when we get into surfacing, we're going to put smoothing on this object and we don't want the top surface of the wine to smooth into the side part of the wine as the morph targets are going back and forth. So we're just going to leave that un unmerged with the rest of it. Just leave it there as it is. Hit the backslash to deselect it. Now we've got our wine object. We need to surface it. I'm just going to call it wine. Hit return to do that. Go to the objects and select save. Um, you can go ahead and save it as wine1.lwo. Um, I already did this earlier, so that's why the name's still in here. Go ahead and hit save. Once that's done, uh, we need to start rotating this top piece to make the morph targets that we're going to use. So stretch this out full view in the face view here, full size. Um, use the period key to kind of zoom in on this a little bit here. And what we're going to do is you can either select a polygon or you can select the points that make it up either way. I'll probably go ahead and just select this top polygon that we have here. Just lasso it there. And go to modify and rotate. Now center the point of the rotation cursor right on the center axis here, right on this point. And then just kind of rotate it a bit to the side. And 
pay, pay attention to the angle in the lower left corner. Right now we're at negative 20 degrees. So we'll go ahead and let it go there. And you see the top's pointing off. All the rest of these are triangles, so that's not going to throw off any kind of uh, um, flatness of the surfaces, so we don't have to worry about that. But we do have kind of a slanting on the two sides here now that we've done this rotation. So in addition to this, you could also maybe not, you know, rotate it quite as much and, uh, and get away with that, but for a, a bit more of a slosh, um, go in once you've got that and choose stretch and hold down the control key and just kind of stretch it out so you've got a bit more of a straight vertical line or something close to it um, on the edge going down to where the points meet with the lower fine mesh. And that looks pretty close. Once you've got that, go into objects, save as. I'm going to save this as wine 2 dot LWO, get the letters right there. Now, if you have Lightweight 4.0 and you have the multiple undos, you can just hit undo twice and that will bring you back to your original. If not, um, go ahead and just reload the original back in and that will go ahead and, and that will keep the point order. Now, we're going to rotate it in the opposite direction. This time, we're going to be doing it a positive 20 degrees. Again, paying attention to the numbers in the lower left corner there. So now we've got that rotated. And then we need to stretch it. Hold down the control key to lock it into just one axis of stretching. And stretch it out so the edge is a bit more straight up and down, or close to it anyway. And then go back into objects save as, and this will be wine3.lwo. Okay, now we've got our wine objects, everything surfaced, and we've got the targets made. Let's go back into layer 5, and we're going to be making our wine glass. Hold down Alt and hit, hit 1. Uh, that's stupid beep on the computer here. Um, we're going to be using our wine object as kind of a reference in the background, and we're going to size this glass up just a little bit. So I'll go ahead and click on size and go right in the very center because the center of our original kind of a lopsided sphere was at this point. That will also keep it so that it stretches evenly on all sides as we are using the size tool. And you can see the size factor down below. Size factor of 1.03 probably do a good enough job. Makes the glass just a little bit larger than the wine object. And from there, we will zoom out just a little bit more. Hit the space to drop the size tool. And we're back with polygon. And we want to take this top polygon again. Oops, didn't let us went right. There we go. And we want to move that vertically. Um, and again, hold the control key down, and that will lock in your movement to just one axis. Kind of move this up a ways to uh, give a little bit of height to our wine glass here. And since we have that polygon there for the top of our glass, we're not going to need it, so just X that polygon out. Now we have the top of the wine glass. We'll go to layer 6, hit Alt-5, and we'll put the wine glass top in the background. Hold the, the down arrow button a little bit, and what we're going to do, zoom out just a touch, maybe down again, is we're going to sketch out using the sketch tool, kind of sketch out um, a base for this wine glass, and probably bring it down uh, right about in this area here for the, for the final part of it. So we'll kind of start in here and just kind of come down and then sweep it out. And hit numeric. We'll go ahead and make that as a curve. Hit enter to make the curve. And then go and multiply. We're going to lay this. Uh, lay this around the y-axis. Um, go ahead and leave it at 16 sides. That should do. Everything else should be fine. Hit OK. Hit enter to lay it around. 
and you've got the stem for the wine glass. Now hit space to deselect that tool and T to move it. We'll move this up just a little bit so it's kind of uh, set into the bottom part of the wine glass, maybe not quite that far. Um, Actually, that should be good enough as it is. You can go in and, and do some more detail on this if you want. The focus of the tutorial is going to be on the morphing technique. So we'll leave this as it is for now. Um, hit Shift and 5, and that will bring those two into the same layer. We'll hit Q. We're going to change this to Wine Glass. And go into Objects, Save As, Wine Glass.lwo. Now we've got the glass, we've got our morph objects, we're going to be moving into layout. Okay, now that we're in layout, we're going to be loading our wine objects. Go to load object, uh, go to objects, and wine tutorial. Select wine one object, load wine two, load wine three. We'll be loading the wine glass a little bit later. Uh, I'm going to get the wine object set up and all the targets and everything first, kind of overlapped on each other in the middle here. So, we're going to go to the objects panel again, uh, first on wine 2, dissolve that out 100%, since 2 and 3 are both targets, we don't need to see their geometry. You can either dissolve them or move them out of the camera view, but dissolving for me seems a little bit easier. Okay, we've got this, um, let's get the camera view here, we'll move the camera uh, select the camera and move it up just a little bit and kind of rotate rotate down right about there lock a key in for the camera now we're going to go in and set the morph envelopes for these we're going to start with the morph envelope for two because two is simply going to be the oscillating factor in this oscillating morph it's going to be going from zero to hundred percent and set so it loops continuously that way it would just be going back and forth from its own geometry to that of uh, wine 3 which has the slosh in the opposite direction so click in the envelope control we're going to set this um, let's say about seven frames seven or eight frames uh, go ahead and create a key at seven and create a key at 14 uh, end behavior repeat for the center key frame we want this to be 100% morphed. Now back on this one, hit the spline control, tension to one, go to this one, spline control, tension of one. That will make a smooth transition at the beginning of the end as it's repeating its way through this continuous morph envelope here. Go ahead and select use envelope. Now the trigger for this whole oscillating morph comes from the morph in, in uh, object one. Actually, when you go to object two, tell it its target is object three. Uh -huh. Morph surfaces doesn't make any difference since they all have the same surface name anyway. Okay, back to wine one. I'm going to go in the envelope, and what we do with wine one is just figure out a trigger time or a certain trigger frame where we want it to begin its morph and then just slow it down from 100% gradually back down to zero, and that will slow down the oscillation of liquid. And you'll see that in just a bit. So keeping in mind that we've got our repeating oscillating morph um, on wine 2 set to every 7 frames. First it goes up at 7, then down at 14, and then 21, 35, so on and so forth. Let's say we want at frame 35, go ahead and create a key at frame 35, but we need to give it some, some uh, time to get into this morph. At frame 35 we want it to be a uh, numeric value of 100% morphed. Let's go ahead and create a key, move back to zero. We'll create another key, oh, numeric, leave that alone. Create a key at maybe about three or four frames back. That will give it some time to build its way into the one sloshed position. So we'll create a key frame at frame 31. Um, go ahead and set the spline control on one for that. And that will give it some time to accelerate its way kind of into this full morph position um, into whatever target it happens to be at at that point. We know that it's every seven frames, so it's going to be one of the two directions. Now we'll create another key. We need to decide how long 
we want it to take to go from full sloshing down to no sloshing again. Um, let's say, let's go ahead and uh, cut it off at 150. So we have a nice long slosh down to nothing here. And for the spline control on this last frame, we'll again set it to a tension of one so that it very smoothly works its way back down into this non-sloshed position. Okay, we'll go ahead and use that envelope. The target for wine one is going to be wine two. The way the cool thing about this oscillation works is that wine one is going to two at that one point and two is just constantly back and forth to wine three. And so that's where the oscillation takes place and wine one just kind of happens to move into that and then we slow it down and, and uh, ease down the sloshing. Now from the camera view, we can just take, um, actually I'm going to go into options, turn the grid off for now since we're not really going to be using it and just kind of slide through the frames that we have here. Um, we will go ahead and create a keyframe for the camera at 150 and so we have a scene 150 is our last frame now we'll slide through these frames and you can see you can see the place in the animation where the morph starts to begin it's right around in this area here like we had it set at 35 and it goes up and then the morph gradually dies back down to the original shape of wine one but in here you can see that we've got different levels of sloshing at different points back around 35 has the most extreme amount of the sloshing because of the morph targets is set 100 percent on on wine one around this point um, what i'll do now is i will do a create a wireframe preview so you can see how this uh, progresses through the course of this 150 frame animation okay i have the wireframe preview finished and as i play it back you'll see right here is where the sloshing kicks in, it goes back and forth and sloshes and dies down. Got it set to loop here. So you can see how it triggers it and the oscillation just keeps happening back and forth and the level of the morph envelope on wine one adjusts how much of that sloshing is going to take place. And you see it peaks at the beginning and then gradually dies back down to nothing at the end of the animation. So with this finished we can uh, Stop that and the preview. Go back in objects and we will load the wine glass. And lo and behold, it's already in place. We'll go to our object. First, we'll go to wine one, create a keyframe at zero. Actually, go back to frame zero, make this a lot easier. Create a keyframe at zero. And the wine's pretty much going to stay in place the whole time. So we will parent this to the wine glass and since we didn't move anything from where they were first loaded in it's already in place now wherever we move the wine glass the wine object goes with it so the majority of the work's done now again what we can do i mentioned this earlier is that often there's some sloshing or turning around of that top sloshing surface um, as, as liquids kind of sloshing around inside the glass so to do that we just create uh, a rotation, uh, a motion envelope for, to make the, the, wine the wine object rotate over a certain period of time while it's sitting in the glass. And to do that, we go back to the wine one object. Um, using the same keyframes that we had set before, we'll create a keyframe at 31. We'll create another keyframe um, at 150. We're not going to do anything at 35. Um, we'll just set back, um, we'll go to frame, go to the next keyframe, frame 31 here. Set the spline control on this to a tension of 1. That way it will be easing into its rotation. Now we go to frame 150. And for this, for the rotation, we want to have a heading of, let's say let's rotate it, um, 180 degrees. Let's say it does a, you know, kind of a backwards turn around during during the sloshing time here. So, create a keyframe for that at 150. Now, you can see that as it's going through these morph targets and sloshing, it's also rotating as well. So, it does the first hit and just kind of rotates and spins. And on this last keyframe, I forgot to do this. We'll also set a tension of one. 
and that way you'll be able to ease back into that uh, rested position after all the sloshing is finished. Now with this, um, we've kind of got a rotating and sloshing effect here with the, with, the, with the wine. We've got the glass in and now we're all set to go ahead and load this into a scene. Okay, the scene that I've loaded in is the same scene I used for the opening animation in this tutorial, Getting Sloshed with Lightwave. Uh, what I'm going to show you here is how the wine and the wine glass all fit into this scene and how the sloshing is triggered, um, how this whole thing takes place. We're going to go to, oops, wrong one. I'm going to go to the front view here, uh, zoom out a bit, um, kind of move this over. And then I want to zoom in. Zoom in. Come on, cooperate here. I'm going to zoom in. No, don't move the camera. I want to zoom in on the wine glass itself and kind of move through this animation. Uh, we'll go and select the one one object so you can kind of see it highlighted there. Now as this goes through, I've got the sloshing word coming in and bumping into the glass. And the frame where it bumps is the first frame of the morph for wine one and then it morphs over the next couple of frames into the oscillating version of wine 2 to wine 3. At the same time the glass kind of slides out of the way and that kind of gives it some reason to start this whole sloshing effect. Uh, it slides over and then kind of comes to a stop just a short distance away and the sloshing keeps going as it's turning around and it sloshes and turns and finally settles back down at the end at frame 150. So let me do a wireframe preview of this and you can see how the sloshing is applied in this animation. Okay, the wireframe preview is finished and I'll play it back right now. See the word sloshing kind of comes in and hits the glass, it triggers the slosh and then it gradually dies down by frame 150 back. Well, I'll go back and I'll show you the actual triggering point. Uh, it triggers back on frame 48 is where the sloshing actually begins to take place. It's morphing its way into the fully sloshed version. Um, and I think I had this set so the oscillation was taking place like every eight frames or something along those lines. Um, and then simply rotated it over the course of the rest of the animation so that it sloshed its way back down to nothing by the end. Um, what I'll do is I'll show you again once through how this uh, action happens. Now what I'll do is I'll show you once again the uh, full rendered version of the same animation. Now let's go through a quick review of the steps used to make the sloshing wine glass technique. Step 1. Make a level 2 tessellated sphere. For a wine shaped object, make the y radius at least twice that of the x and z radii. Step 2. Lasso the top half and cut it off. Step 3. Make a copy of the object and place it into another layer for making the liquid's container later on. Step 4. Lasso all the bottom polygons except for the uppermost layer and subdivide it with the smooth option to make a fine mesh. Step 5. Lasso the top points, copy them to another layer, trace them to make a top polygon, and then cut and paste this polygon back to the original layer and do not merge the points. Step 6. Give the object a surface name of wine and save it as wine 1. Step 7. Rotate and stretch the top polygon of this object to make one of the morph targets. Save it as wine 2. Step 8. Hit undo twice or simply reload wine 1 
and rotate and stretch the top polygon in the opposite direction. Save it as wind 3. Step 9. Take the copy you made earlier and put into another layer and size this copy by 1.03 to make the top of the wine glass. Move the top points up in the positive y direction to add height to the glass. Step 10. Sketch and lay the base for the wine glass in another layer. Step 11. Select both wine glass layers and surface all the polygons as wine glass and save the object as wine glass. Step 12. In layout, load all three wine objects. Step 13. Dissolve wine 2 and wine 3 100%. Step 14. Make wine 3 the target of wine 2 and wine 2 the target of wine 1. Step 15. Create a repeating oscillating envelope for wine 2. Step 16. Create the envelope for wine 1 so that it peaks at 100% at a given frame, then gradually drops down to 0%. Use the timing established for wine 2 as a reference for the sloshing trigger frame. Step 17. Load the wine glass parent to wine and parent the wine 1 object to the wine glass. And step 18. If desired, create some rotation keyframes to turn wine 1 as it sloshes around. Well, that's all the time I have for this tutorial. A couple things to mention though before I finish this up. Um, a similar technique can be used to create sloshing liquids in other kinds of containers. It just takes a little modification when you're creating the original object and the morph targets. Also, I didn't cover surfacing because the focus of the tutorial was to be upon the sloshing effect itself. You can go and surface the wine and the wine glass any way you want. Until next time, I'm Justin Barrett, and thanks for joining me on Lightspeed.